in yesterday's episode, we got to learn more about our new companion, Follows Chalk. He joins us as we scour Zion Valley for pre-war tools. He gave us three quests to complete to find different tools scattered across the valley. The first quest is Roadside Attraction. Joshua Graham wants us to find a compass so that Daniel and his sorrows can navigate their way out of Zion Canyon if they need to. The search for a compass brings us to one of the saddest places I've yet seen in any Fallout game. West of the Dead Horses Camp, lying in the middle of the river between a ravine, we find a bus broken in half. See this? This is why your own two feet are better than any cart, whether it's pulled by critters or goes on its own. But this wasn't just any bus. This is a crashed scout bus. Inside we find the skeletons of a dozen or so children. These skeletons are much smaller than usual, as are their little suitcases. We don't know what kind of scouts these were. Boy scouts, girl scouts, weeblos. But before the apocalypse, this valley was a national park. Zion National Park. It's likely that these scouts were going on a camping trip here. Inside the bus, we find their personal belongings scattered all over. Toy cars, lunch boxes, cherry bombs, even some Dinky the Dinosaur toys. But the item we need to find to complete the quest is a compass. We find it lying on the floor of this bus, still clutched in the hand of a dead child. Upon activating it, we have quite a few different options to repair this thing. With a repair of 30 or greater, we can simply repair it. Otherwise, we need to find parts to repair it. The part we need to repair it is the compass sensor module, which we find here on the bus. Our third option is to take the broken compass with us, whereupon we can bring it to any workbench here in Zion Canyon and repair it. Our next quest is Gone Fishing. With this quest, we need to find and retrieve some walkie-talkies for Daniel and his sorrows to use during their evacuation. To find the walkie-talkies, we head to the Zion Fishing Lodge in the northwestern part of Zion. Like all pre-war buildings in Zion Valley, this lodge is covered with the warning handprints of the sorrows. And for good reason. As soon as we enter this lodge, we get attacked by a slew of geckos. <laughs> Once dead, we can explore the lodge, and thanks to the tribal taboo, it has remained unlooted these past 200 years. Here we find quite a lot of scrap and salvage. The walkie-talkies are securely locked up in a cabinet, but the cabinet is locked. We need to find the key. Thankfully, the key is easy to find. If you head into the bathroom, we find a crate lying on the ground. Inside, we find some ammunition and the fishing lodge cabinet key. With the key in hand, we can head out and turn east, where we find a gun cabinet against the wall. Here we find quite a stash of ammunition, and then on a side table next to it, we find a copy of Patriot's Cookbook. But the cabinet we need to unlock to retrieve the walkie-talkies is behind the bar. Using the key that we found in the crate, we can unlock it, loot an atomic cocktail, a Nuka-Cola, and two walkie-talkies. With that, we complete the quest Gone Fishing, and if we want, we can loot the hunting shotgun leaning against the bar. The final quest we need to complete is Tourist Trap. We need to retrieve five Lil Scout lunchboxes from the Zion General Store. And then we need to head to the Zion Ranger Station to retrieve the medical supply kit. We find the general store a short ways away from the fishing lodge. Inside, we can kill a couple of mole rats and some mantises before searching for our components. But this is rather interesting. Mantises? The last time I saw mantises was at Vault 22. We learned from the terminals at Vault 22 that the mantises were part of an experiment going on at Vault 22, which caused them to mutate and grow over the years, turning them into the dangerous creatures we find today. But Vault 22 is very far away from the Zion Canyon. What are these mantises doing here? The general store itself is quite a treasure trove. We can walk away with bottles of Nuka-Cola, Sunset Sarsaparilla, a wide assortment of toys, scrap, and salvage, and we find two of the Little Scout lunchboxes sitting on the countertop between two lanterns. Two down, three to go. But best of all, heading behind the counter, we find the Zion National Park snow globe lying on the bottom shelf of a display case next to the register. Inside the cash register, we find the general store desk key. 
To continue our hunt, we can go through the northern door into the office. Whoa. Here we have to get rid of a pesky bloatfly. Using the key that we looted from the cash register, we can unlock the desk. Inside the desk, we find one more Little Scout lunchbox. Three down, two to go. Here we find one of the few functional pre-war terminals, locked with a very easy lock. After hacking the terminal, we can learn more about this general store and their business. The first note is shipping error. We learned that the manager of this general store was a man named Horace Applebaum. He placed an order with a woman named Mandy for some deluxe Mountain Man all-in-one survival kits. The ones that conveniently come with a compass, a pair of walkie-talkies, and a first aid kit. Exactly the items we're trying to collect for Daniel. But sadly, Horace never received the shipment. Tourist season is really picking up and those survival kits sell well. He really hopes they arrive ASAP. I don't think they ever did because if they had, we would have been able to find everything we needed to complete all of these quests here in the general store. In the next one, called Bus Tour, we see a letter from Horace to Scoutmaster Mitchum. We learned that the Scoutmaster had ordered some Little Scout lunchboxes from the general store here. He wanted to let the scouts know that the lunchboxes arrived and were ready for pickup at the general store. I suppose we can presume that the scouts never made it to pick up the lunchboxes since we find them here. But then again, it could be that Horace had a whole bunch of lunchboxes. The scouts came, bought some, and left, and afterwards Horace had five remaining. And it may be that these scouts are the very scouts whose bus we found crashed and burned in the middle of the Virgin River. There are a couple of things that don't add up, however. Horace says that we look forward to seeing you and your scouts on Independence Day, and the date of Horace's previous note to Mandy was June 15th, 2057. That's 20 years before the bombs dropped. Now, the bus tour note is not dated, so it could have been written at any time, but why would they bother to keep an email sent to an inventory supplier for 20 years. The final note is labeled shipping problems again. Who's running this shipping company, says Horace. I just received three crates of Dinky the Dinosaur officially licensed dino action dolls, which as he says, were supposed to go to some tourist trap in Nevada. I think we all know exactly where these were supposed to go. He says, Mandy, what am I supposed to do with these? I suppose if I file off the dinky trademark, I can sell these as kitty souvenirs and make a few bucks, but I'm still looking at a major loss here. Whatever's going on in your shipping department, take care of it, or I'll find somebody else to handle my orders. P.S. I still haven't received that order of survival gear I requested last month. You know, the things I actually sell to people? This just makes the whole thing really confusing. At the end of this message, he refers to the very first message we read, which was written in June 2057. Since the bus tour message is sandwiched between these two messages, we can presume that the second shipping problems message was written after the bus tour message. Since the second shipping's problem message mentions the order of survival gear he didn't receive that he talked about in his first message, I think we can presume that Horace's letter to the Scoutmaster happened in July of 2057. Again, 20 years before the bombs dropped. If that's the case, then either A, the bus that we found with all of the dead scouts in it happened in 2057, and their corpses laid there in the river for 20 years before the bombs dropped. Or that B, Horace was sending a letter to some different scout troop 20 years before that bus happened to crash in the river due to the nuclear apocalypse. Or C, that Horace simply got the date wrong. He meant to sign it June 15th, 2077, but instead signed it June 15th. 15th, 2057. Perhaps he just miswrote the date. But even if Horace just got the year wrong, we still have to deal with the months. These messages spanned two months, June and July. He even refers to Independence Day. But the bombs didn't drop until October 23rd, 2077. Which brings us back to the same problem. If the scout bus is the same bus mentioned in this terminal, then it means that they crashed sometime before or after reaching the general store and sat there for two months before the bombs dropped. But here's something I just realized. We found all those Dinky the Dinosaur toys on the bus. 
which means either A, the scouts came from Nevada and just so happened to stop by the Dino Light Motel where they bought the souvenir dinosaurs before continuing their trip to Utah to go camping at the Zion National Park, or B, they reached the general store first and bought some of those Dinky the Dinosaur toys and then crashed on their way back. If the latter, then we still have the problem of them rotting in that ravine for 20 years and two months, or only two months if you believe that Horace simply miswrote the year before the bombs dropped. At any rate, that's ancient history. Let's go back to the present. And in the present, we still need to find two more lunchboxes. These last two were a little bit tricky to find. We find the fourth one sitting inside a crate on top of a stack of crates against the western wall just south of the office door. The final one is inside the office. We find it on the bottom of a broom cabinet behind a broom. With that, we get all five lunchboxes and can move on to getting the medical kit. To find the kit, we go to the nearby Zion Ranger Station. We have to be careful because the Yaogwai wander nearby and they can come down the hill to attack. Inside the Ranger Station, we find a few scorpions. After they're dead, we can loot the place. Inside the refrigerator, we find scotch, vodka, and whiskey. This will be important in a minute. Heading into the bunk room, we find two foot lockers. One is locked with an average lock. Inside, we find a lot of great ammunition, including some 45 automatic overpressured ammunition. And on a table in this room, we find the contaminated medical supply kit. The problem, of course, is that it is contaminated. We need to find a way to sterilize this. We have three options, all of which need a medicine skill of 30 or more to complete. We can replace the contaminated parts with duct tape and turpentine, both of which we can find in the general store. Or we can disinfect the contaminated bandages with alcohol using scotch, vodka, or whiskey that we found in the refrigerator. Or we can just take the incomplete medical kit with us. Since I found the alcohol, I decided to sterilize it. That completes the quest tourist trap, and now all we have to do is find Daniel and his sorrows to deliver the goods. One more thing to note, heading back outside, we can climb up a hillside and use it to jump up on top of the roof. On the roof of this cabin, we find a bunch of 45 caliber ammunition cases and the skeleton of a man who was at one time sitting in this chair, but now has a tomahawk in his back. This tells me that tribal warfare has been going on here for quite some time. The skeleton is clearly in an advanced state of decomposition, so it's been here for at least a few decades. Now we need to find the Sorrows Camp. We find the Sorrows Camp in the northwesterly corner of Zion Canyon. This is the Narrows, just north of the Caterpillar's Mound. The Narrows up ahead. That's the Sorrows territory. They're peaceful enough, but you don't want to make them mad. To get to the camp, we follow a river through the canyon until the ravine widens. Here we see tents and shacks laid out and bridges crisscrossing the river, connecting ledges upon which more shacks are built. While exploring, a woman runs up to greet us. You are the one Joshua Graham sent to us. Blessings of the father in the cave on you. Daniel is waiting for you. Oh, thanks. Good to meet you. Hey, can you tell me more about Daniel? I don't really know much about him. Daniel is a wise man and a great friend to the Sorrows. He taught me to speak the language of New Canaan, the English from the Holy Books. Uh, Holy Books? Yes. The language of the New Canaanites is the Holy Tongue, for it is the language their sacred books are written in. The Father in the Caves brought it to them after the Judgment, but the ancestors of the Sorrows sinned against him. They were denied the true tongue. Uh, okay, I'm confused. I thought you guys didn't believe in the god of the new Canaanites and instead believed in someone called the Father in the Cave. Who or what is your Father in the Cave? Have you not heard of the god of the new Canaanites? He is our protector and our judge. He helped our ancestors find their place here in Zion. He gave us many gifts, but we are not to seek him out. His caves are forbidden to us. Those who seek them out are taken from us. Wait, wait, wait. That doesn't sound anything like the religion of the New Canaanites. Perhaps you do not fully understand the New Canaanites. I have seen the Father's images. His Holy Bride and Holy Son were given unto the world to save it. 
They dwelt in the caverns of the mountains, caverns which can still be seen today. The people sinned against him and were punished with the end that came in fire and the loss of the holy tongue. Only the new Canaanites were spared. Oh, okay, I think I see what's going on here. The Sorrows are reinterpreting their own faith through the faith of New Canaan. So when Daniel talks to them about the god of the New Canaanite religion, they see that god as their father in the cave. I see, I see, that's fascinating. I'm sure Daniel could tell you more. His knowledge of the father is greater than my own. Tell me a little bit more about your tribe. We have dwelt in the Narrows since the end that came in fire. When the Father in the caves punished the world and made us forget the Holy Tongue. We have had good relations with the other tribes in the valley. At least before Salt Upon Wounds brought his white legs here. We have Daniel to thank for our continued existence. His advice and help has kept the white legs from overrunning us so far. I do not know how long even he can protect us though. All right, so they think that the father in the caves was responsible for the nuclear apocalypse. And since the scripture that Daniel is reading is written in English, and since they believe that the father in the caves gave that scripture to Daniel, they believe that English then is the holy tongue. Since they don't speak English until the new Canaanites teach it to them, they see that as some sort of punishment from the father in the caves. Well, Waking Cloud, what do you know about Salt Upon Wounds? He is war chief of the White Legs and the worst butcher of them all. The tribes he has crushed are many. The warriors he has slain, countless. Sounds like the Sorrows and the Dead Horses are in agreement on that. Thanks, Waking Cloud, that's all I needed to know for now. Then I will look forward to our next speaking. Waking Cloud then goes off on her own to read some scripture. It seems like the new Canaanites have not only taught them how to speak English, but also to read it. Greetings and blessings to you. Daniel still awaits you. To find Daniel, we continue along the river. He wades through waist-deep water until he reaches a slope and then walks up into the hills towards another Sorrows camp. He stops at a campfire, and it's here where we can talk with him. The dead horse has told me details about the attack on your caravan. A stranger's sympathy might not count for much, but for what it's worth, I'm sorry. The Sorrows will mourn your friends too. They mourn everyone, even the White Legs. They have sensitive souls. Innocent, if there is such a thing. In spite of what's happened, I hope that Joshua and I can help you out of here. But to be frank, we need your help too. Pleasure to meet you, Daniel. What do you do here? I used to help the Sorrows with various medical problems and general issues they were having, but my bishop sent me here as a missionary. We new Canaanites believe that there is a path to salvation for everyone, and it's important that we set people on that path if they are willing. Salvation? From what, the wasteland? A spiritual wasteland, yes. We believe that before this life, our souls existed elsewhere. And after we die, our souls will leave this world. During our time here, we have the burden of choice. The choices we make determine where we go in the spirit world and how we will face judgment. New Canaanites believe, as many once did, that God was made flesh here on earth as a man named Jesus Christ. He sacrificed his life to save us. Every sin, every terrible thing that you, me, or any one of us have done for all time was washed away by his blood. We just have to accept his love. That's why we visit the tribes, to spread the good news. For all we know, we new Canaanites may be all that remains of Christ's followers. We can respond to this in three ways. We can be belligerent and say, why don't you teach them something useful instead of filling their heads with nonsense? We teach them practical skills for this life and we prepare them for what's to come. The sorrows could master all the wonders of the old world, conquer the great basin north to south, but without God's love, they would have nothing. It is shelter in the storm, food in times of hunger, warmth and light in the cold and darkness. What can compare to that in value and versatility? You don't agree. That's your choice. It can be their choice, too. No one is forced to follow the narrow path. Or we can be skeptical and say, sounds kind of far-fetched, even for the wasteland. Good news is an amazing thing in this world we've unmade. 
We're so used to going to sleep with nightmares that we can't imagine waking up to a dream. But that's what we believe. Every word of it. It's the cornerstone of our faith and how we choose to live. With every step you take, you put one foot in front of the other and know that you'll be pulled back down to this earth. We know that God is watching over us, waiting for us to come back home. To us, there's no difference. Walking and living, it's all belief, all faith. Or we can be good listeners and say, interesting. <laughs> That's actually a better response than I usually get from Wastelanders. No offense. Tell you what, there's a lot going on right now, but why don't you take this? Read it. Maybe you'll hate it. Maybe you'll be bored. But if you have questions, assuming we get through all this, let me know. It used to be my job to answer those questions. Maybe it will be again. If we choose this option, Daniel gives us a copy of his scripture. It appears in the miscellaneous section of our inventory, and sadly we can't read it. It's just an item with a book icon and a weight of one. We can learn more about his new Canaanite faith by saying, What does a bishop do? Is he like your boss? Yeah. Bishop Mordecai is... <sighs> Sorry. Mordecai was my bishop. He was killed by Whitelegs during the attack on New Canaan. He was responsible for our congregation there. I don't know who my next bishop will be, but that's a problem for tomorrow. There are plenty of troubles here for us today. What happened at New Canaan? We lost it. Our community, everything. But the past is gone. We have to look forward. Daniel, you mentioned your bishop Mordecai. Were you close to him? Look, I've got a lot to do here. My personal relationship, it's not important right now. Can't see how it concerns you anyway. You're the man in charge. If something's troubling you, it could affect us all. I never thought I'd be in charge of anything. Don't know why. Bishop Mordecai was old. He had been sick for years. He couldn't walk anymore. It wasn't a problem for the rest of us. <laughs> he made it out to be more trouble than it really was. Just his way, I guess. When the white legs came, he was upstairs. We couldn't get him out in time. The house caught fire at the base and worked its way up. Fast. He didn't die of smoke. I wish he had. Sometimes I wake up and for a minute or two I think all of it was a dream. But it's not. It wasn't. I wish all of this were some fevered vision of what could have been, instead of what is. What we let happen. Why won't you tell me what happened at New Canaan? It's not a subject I'm fond of discussing. It's over and done with anyway. Why are you so interested? Here we can pass a speech check by saying, if you don't acknowledge your past now, it'll come back to haunt you later. True enough. We can't escape it no matter how hard we try. Best we can do is own up. Trust in the Lord to forgive. Joshua was gone. So were a lot of the other New Canaanites. White Legs must have been watching for a long while, counting who remained. We didn't think the White Legs were a real threat. Maybe it was overconfidence. Maybe sloth. Either way, we didn't see them coming. They attacked at night. They killed without regard to age or infirmity. Armed or unarmed, they beat children to death in their beds while they were sleeping. And now we're all that's left. Maybe 30 of us. Pride goeth before destruction. That last bit tells us that the scripture must be the English Bible. Because that line he just quoted is Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. We also know the translation he was using. He said, pride goeth before destruction. Goeth is the third person singular simple present indicative form of the word go, which is used in a few different translations, but the best known is the King James Version. You said you used to help the sorrows with problems. What do you do now? I'm trying to make amends for allowing our problem to become their problem. The new Canaanites, I mean. The white legs have always fought with us. And with Joshua returning, Caesar has motivated the White Legs to stamp out the new Canaanites entirely. That means the tribes we work with, too. It's already hap- I just want to prevent something terrible from happening to the Sorrows. Has this happened before? The White Legs attacking other tribes? 
Yes. But not just white legs. Raiders, too. Prospectors, slavers, anyone who thinks they can exploit the ignorant and the innocent. We lost the tar walkers and the crazy horns. We did our best, but we made mistakes. We paid for them. But they paid more. I'd like to get out from under that debt someday. Until then, it's enough to stop ourselves from getting deeper in the hole. Well, the white legs are already here, so what's your plan? To remove the sorrows from harm's way. I have to give credit to the white legs for finding their way here. Though I imagine many died in the process. But they can't follow us east. Not into the grand staircase. They don't know how to live off the land. We head there. We can find some safety. Why are you so eager to evacuate Zion? You don't seem to be a pacifist. There's an old saying that goes... If you want peace, get ready for war. You've got me figured half right. I'll shoot dead any white leg that tries to creep into this camp. But it's only to protect the sorrows. The Lord helps those who help themselves. But the sorrows don't know how. Joshua and I do. Since I got them into this mess, I need to get them out. Here, he, he makes a common mistake. He says, the Lord helps those who help themselves, likely intending to quote scripture. But even though many people think so, that phrase is not actually found in the Bible. The phrase, God helps those who help themselves, originated as an ancient Greek proverb. It was even used in some of Aesop's fables. Anyway, we have three choices on how to respond to Daniel. We can choose an active response and say, if you're willing to defend the sorrows, why not pursue the white legs? There is an important difference between killing in defense and waging war. Even a Gentile like you should know that. Well, Joshua's a new Canaanite, and he's obviously willing to attack the White Legs. Joshua is a living Bible of all mankind's miseries of war. The debt he has levied through his actions, he repays every day. He is a monument both to God's unending forgiveness and to humanity's unfathomable capacity for cruelty. It's written on every inch of his body. When you look at him, do you only see a man of God? Beneath those bandages, he is burned flesh. As he burns, so does he consume everyone around him. Joshua wants to fight because the white legs have stoked the naked flame inside of him. You, you see the light, but do not yet feel the heat. I can pray that you never will, but it isn't up to me. And it isn't up to God. It's up to Joshua. Well, protecting the sorrows and evacuating them from Zion sure is a whole lot of responsibility you've taken on for yourself. The new Canaanites interfered in their lives. We did that. And we've done it before, with others. Always with good intentions, but things go wrong. When that happens, we can't just abandon them. Let them die at the hands of new Canaan's enemies. Joshua's come up with a reasonable alternative. Why not help the dead horses fight? Joshua doesn't just want to fight the White Legs, he wants to annihilate them. The stakes are too high for their tribe. Hurting them won't dissuade them. If they can't join Caesar's Legion, they'll die out in a generation. They've never learned how to survive. Food preservation, tanning, even basic hunting and cooking seem beyond them. They only survive by scavenging and raiding. But that can't last. They'll only stop if Joshua and the dead horses can kill their war chief and their entire war band. That's exactly what he intends to do. Or we can choose the pacifist route and say, you're right to leave, but I don't think you should kill any of the white legs. You're free to hold that opinion, but you're not responsible for these people. If I have to kill to prevent their blood from being spilled, so be it. Daniel, the use of violence only leads to more violence. Try walking alongside a tribal child, a refugee, and holding her hand for three days because her parents were killed by NCR prospectors. After the prospectors have stalked the remainder of the tribe, they fire off a few shots to scare them, and the tribe bunches together for safety. A grenade comes rolling in and kills another six people. The only reason you survive is because someone else's body absorbed the shrapnel. You're left sprawled out on the ground with ringing in your ears and a little girl's hand in your hand because that's all that's left of her. After you've done that, 
If you can look me in the eye and tell me it's better to stand aside, maybe then I'll listen to you. This shocked me. Daniel is speaking as if this has actually happened. Are NCR prospectors known for doing this? Is it common for prospectors to kill tribals? That is awful. Speaking of awful, Daniel, what do you know of the White Legs? They're hateful savages who live only to plunder and destroy. Their leader is a devil called Salt Upon Wounds. War is all he knows. Everything he has, everything that tribe has, was taken by force, raiding, and scavenging. It's said there's no man deadlier at close range. That that power fist of his has smashed a hundred skulls. Maybe that's true, but so what? It's a low form of leadership. A tribe that knows only war has no future. And so he'll lead them to Caesar. I was talking with Waking Cloud about the Sorrow's faith. What do you know about their father in the caves? Father in the... Oh, right. He's some spirit the Sorrows used to believe in. Watched over them from the caves in the valley. They marked some of the caves around here because they think they'll be punished for going inside. I think as more of them learn the teachings of the new Canaanites, they'll lose their old superstitions. Yeah, about that. Uh, you may want to have a chat with them, because I think that they think that your lord and their father are the same. Oh? Oh. <sighs> of course. How stupid of me. They probably also think Mary is the mother and Jesus is the child. No wonder they picked up on things so easily. I guess it just goes to show how difficult it is to communicate sometimes. Well, now that we've learned more about Daniel and the Sorrows, we can tell Daniel why we're here. Daniel, Joshua told me you needed a few things. Well, I think this is everything. Well, I'll be. I was starting to lose hope we'd be able to get any of this, much less all of it. Tribals are smart, but, well, they're ignorant. <sighs> Letting go of a taboo is difficult for them. So I knew it would have to be one of us. Turns out all it took was a Gentile, or, uh, no offense. These supplies are a godsend. But if we're going to evacuate Zion without drawing more white leg attention, I need you to go back into the valley. Specifically, I need you to scout out some locations for white legs and try to recover a map of Grand Staircase, a wilderness area to the east. There's also the matter of the roads. We're going to be heading out of the east side of the park, but I'm not sure the way is clear. With that, we complete the quest and get the achievement, Restore Our Future. We can then respond to his additional request one of three ways. We can say, come on, I got you everything you needed. Just give me the map already. Okay, you better listen close because I'm not going to repeat myself. You were not invited here. This is not your home. We have what you might call a compulsion to help you on account of our beliefs. But if you continue to spit in our eye with insults and profanity, you'll find out what happens when our patience wears out. People died at New Canaan because we bickered and debated about what to do. That was a mistake. Complaining to me now? Also a mistake. I'm not going to add sin upon sin by listening to your grumbling. You want the map? Get out in that valley. Help us. One of the Sorrows, Waking Cloud, will go with you. She knows how to get around the valley unseen. She's also a midwife and has three kids of her own, so she'll be more tolerant of your whining. After disappointing Daniel with our impatience, we can again respond to him in one of three ways. We can say, forget that, I'll be taking the map now. You just don't learn, do you? In which case we fail all of our active quests, and Daniel, Joshua, Graham, and all of the tribals oh, yeah. turn hostile. This really surprised me. Was I being violent by saying I'll be taking that map now? It almost feels out of character for them to turn hostile so quickly. Alternatively, we can respond to his quest curtly by saying, Fine. Fantastic. In which case he responds curtly. Or we can apologize for being short-tempered earlier, and by passing a speech check we can say, Hey Daniel, I apologize. I think the stress got the best of me. <sighs> I understand. But I hope you can understand why it's so important for us to leave here as soon as we can. I... We couldn't save New Canaan. This is a chance to make up for that. To start again. We can't fail. Now, those were the outcomes if we initially responded to his request with impatience. But we do have two other ways to respond. 
We can respond begrudgingly by saying, well, if it'll get me out of here, sure, I'll help. Listen, I understand that you want to go home, but we didn't ask you to come to Zion. As far as I'm concerned, you're an uninvited guest. In better times, I'd drop everything to help you out. But I have to ensure the safety of the Sorrows first. And don't think you're alone in this. One of the Sorrows, Waking Cloud, has volunteered to help you in the valley. She's an experienced hunter and has a special gift for staying out of sight when she needs to. Should make things easier for you. After that, all that's left is to evacuate the Sorrows safe and sound. I'll give you a map and supplies, everything you need to get back home. Or we can respond with generosity and say, anything to help, I'll do what I can. I appreciate the enthusiasm. There aren't a lot of people in the wasteland with kindness to spare for anyone who isn't kin. Since you've been poking around the valley, you might see more activity from the White Legs. One of the Sorrow's hunters, Waking Cloud, has volunteered to help guide you through the valley. She has a special talent for staying out of sight. After this, it's just a matter of getting everyone out of here safe and sound. And hopefully, you can head back to the Mojave without any more trouble. Regardless of how we choose to handle this, the end result is the same. We start the quest, The Grand Staircase, as well as a few optional quests, and Follows Chuck says goodbye. Well, here we part ways. I'm needed back at the Dead Horses camp. Maybe I'll see you there sometime. Are you sure? You've been a useful companion so far. Sorry. Joshua was pretty clear. Get you to Daniel, then come on home. You can take it up with him if you'd like. We can respond in two ways. We can be snarky and say, Typical, just when I get a useful minion. Hey, it's not my fault. And what's this minion stuff? That's it. See you around, civilized woman. Or we can respond with kindness and say, Give my regards to Joshua. I will. Good gunnin, Akis. With that, Follows Chalk leaves our company and goes back to the Dead Horses camp. But we now have the option to take Waking Cloud as a companion. We now have to prepare the way for the Sorrow's retreat by defeating some Yagwai, clearing traps off of a bridge, and repulsing some White Leg scouts. But first, in tomorrow's episode, we will get to know our new companion, Waking Cloud, a little bit better. So stay tuned for that. What are your thoughts on Daniel and how he's been dealing with the Sorrows? What are your thoughts on the Sorrows religion with their godlike figure, the Father in the Caves? Never fear, ladies and gentlemen, we will delve more into the Father in the Caves in an upcoming video. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I hope you've been enjoying this series so far. We're not even halfway through. We have many great videos ahead of us. If you're enjoying this series, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. And let me just take a moment to thank each and every one of you. With this video, my channel finally reached 400,000 subscribers. I am blown away by the growth of this channel, and I'm so thankful for those of you who come back every day to watch my videos. It means a whole lot to me, and it's you who have helped make this channel more successful than I ever thought it would be. Thank you so much for subscribing and watching and sharing my videos. You've helped me to live my dream and to do this full time. We won't stop at 400,000. No, we've got a long future ahead of us. I'll keep on publishing videos as long as you keep watching. And on that note, I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.